Welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Where are the Grants? Financing Strategies for New Farmers. I'm Jessie Schmidt and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project and the Women's Ag Network. I'll be moderating this evening. Our presenter tonight is Mary Peabody, Community Economic Economic Development Specialist for UVM Extension. Mary is the Director of the Vermont New Farmer Project and the Women's Ag Network and has worked with many farmers in Vermont and beyond to create sustainable farm businesses. Welcome, Mary. Great. Thank you, Jesse. And good evening, everybody. This is kind of fun. I don't get to do a lot of these, um, these webinars anymore, so it's always fun for me to, to get to chat with you folks. And um, as Jesse said, I hope you'll all um, uh, use the chat box. Uh, be sure if you have a question, don't let it slip away from your mind. Go ahead and type it out while you're thinking about it, and um, we'll get to it. And um, also, it looks I've been trying to catch. If there's anybody here who doesn't live in Vermont, just uh, give us a heads up in the chat box, and I'll um, try to remember to. to um, adjust some of my comments as I go because a lot of the examples that I'm going to use tonight are Vermont and but that doesn't mean that there are no opportunities outside of Vermont. So uh, anyway, so we're going to talk tonight, we're going to have a little conversation about um, uh, one of the most common questions that that Jesse and I and the folks uh, that work with beginning farmers get and that is, um, okay, I thank you, I see somebody from Michigan, excellent. So uh, what is, uh, so you know, where can I find a grant to start my farm or where can I get a grant for my farm? Um, and there's um, a disappointing answer and then there is a slightly more optimistic answer. So hang in there with me while we uh, move through this and I will try not to uh, be too much of a wet blanket. Um, and give you some some tips along the way. Uh, so what we're going to talk about tonight is kind of we're going to start in kind of a strange place. Is we're going to try answering this question about how much is enough, uh, and hopefully I'll make a good case for why you need to do some homework and have a good answer for that before you uh, begin starting anywhere. Then we'll go ahead and talk about sources of money. Um, and we're going to talk about more than just grants because the truth of the matter is is that it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to start and sustain an agricultural business uh, from just one pot of money. So we're going to talk about um, a bunch of the different types, including some of the sort of new and emerging non-traditional sources and some of the old, really old and reliable sources. Um, and then as we go along, I'm going to try to give you some tips from the trenches on how to close the deal and how to be successful in your efforts. Um, and this is where it will really help me out if you go ahead and ask some questions as we go because it will give me a sense of sort of what's on your mind and what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> so, all right. Here's the thing. How much is enough? This is where you really have to uh, start off by doing your homework. Um, and creating that business plan or at least an outline or a draft of a business plan before you go. And you've really got to understand the finances because what you can't do is you can't get in, you're not going to be successful if you just randomly start applying for grants to do A and then apply for a small business loan to do B and apply for something else for another pot of money to do C. It's all got to be part of one coordinated logical plan. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself in trouble and the trouble can range all the way from um, just not being successful in getting money to getting to yourself into some hot water uh, legally because there's, as we go along, and we're going to be talking about some of the ramifications of what you can and cannot do. And if you don't have a good plan, um, even if your intentions are really, really good, you can get yourself into some trouble. Um, oh, okay, we have somebody from Uruguay even. That's, that's far. Okay. Um, so what I want you to do is, first of all, you need to do the research and have at least a rudimentary business plan. Uh, the second thing that you want to do is learn the basics of financial statements. And you can do, there's a lot of ways to do this. There's certainly a ton of information on the internet. We have stuff on our New Farmer website that's available. There's workshops, there are classes, there are um, online um, recorded webinars. Mark will be talking next month on the, on the uh, on this webinar a little bit about basic financial statements, I'm sure, and record keeping. So you really need to, to give yourself the opportunity to learn the language of money and most of us are not that, that fond of doing the financials and the record keeping. It's not what 
people are passionate about. It certainly isn't what most farmers get into farming to do. But it is one of the very first steps that you're going to have to take is to be very comfortable with the language that you're going to uh, use to communicate with others about your needs. Uh, the third bullet has to do with um, something that I see happen an awful lot, and it's related to the quote that you see over on the right-hand side. And it really is true that more businesses fail, including agricultural businesses, because of undercapitalization than for any other reason. Um, so don't get yourself into a position where you're negotiating away um, money that you're really going to need. So in a an example, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go, but one example would be, uh, you know, if a lender, if you ask for $50,000 and the lender says, well, I'm sorry, but you only qualify for 30, and you say, great, I'll take it. Well, unless you've got a plan to make up that $20,000 difference, that's going to come out of your hide. Uh, and over time, it's going to create some problems for you. It is going to wear away um, at your stamina. It's going to wear away at your health. It's going to, it's going to create stress for you. Um, and chances are good that the business isn't going to thrive because, it needed, because your planning indicated that you needed that 50000 and now you're trying to do it with thirty. So um, just, just be mindful of that because I know the temptation is great when you're really chomping at the bit to get started and somebody says, well, I can't give it all to you, but I can give you this much. You know, I can give you 80% of it. Um, unless you've got a good plan to make up that 20%, you can get yourself into some trouble in a really um, uncomfortable uh, situation. And the next one is you need to be honest with yourself and with the other people that you're talking about, about what your limitations are and about what your capabilities are. And, you know, again, this has a lot to do with um, how much can I live on. It's a very common question for lenders to ask um, is, you know, how am I going, you know, how are you going to live for those first years once you quit your job, once you leap over that, that gap? Um, <coughs> and um, one of, you know, sorry, I just got distracted a minute by something. I'm going to turn a pop-up off on my screen. Um, okay, so anyways, you want to be honest with yourself and with others. And one of the one of the things, as I was saying, is you know how much can you live on. So you just need to be really clear with what your needs are. One of the things that I hear a lot is, oh, we don't really need much to live on at all. We we live, you know, bare bones existence here. We're you know. Um, and that's fine, except remember, you're going to have to be sustaining this over, the, over a long period, you know, over two years, three years, five years, whatever it's going to take. Um, and know your limits about what can you really sustain. Can you really start a business and work two part-time off-farm jobs? Um, what is it that you're, you're going to need to, to survive? And what is it that your family and the other people that are involved in this are going to need to survive? And how are they feeling about the risks that you're, you're potentially going to take? So um, this how much is enough question is where you have to start. Um, hardly anybody ever wants to hear that part. But doing the research, um, doing the homework, getting stuff down on paper, uh, playing with the numbers, um, and being pretty confident of the information that you uh, that you have at your disposal before you start figuring out what's the right avenue to go after for money is the way that you really need to approach this. Because regardless of whether it's a grant, a loan, a gift, whatever it is, it's going to come with some strings attached. Um, so you need to really be clear about what it is that's, um, that's driving you and, and what that money is going to do for you. So let's start with some grants. So first of all, uh, we'll go over a few examples of grants, and there are some out there. Um, a grant is foremost a legally binding contract, and that's something that you really need to remember, because a lot of times we get into the creative writing part of it and, and um, requesting things, and we forget that uh, this is really a contract with another organization, very often with an arm of the government. So uh, you want to take it very seriously when you're doing. Um, it requires a lot of planning. It requires some good writing skills. Um, it requires good budgeting. Um, and it requires, requires follow-up. I don't know of any grant that is not going to ask you for some follow-up reporting that will be required. And you want to make sure that you'll be that you will be um, that you understand the timelines, that you understand the expectations, and that you're willing to follow through before you sign anything that um, gives you the access to the money. 
Another thing that's a surprise for a lot of folks that are looking into grants for the first time is cost share. And cost share is pretty common and getting even more common in these days of uh, scarce resources um, in most grants. And a cost share is basically the same thing that equity is in a loan. Cost share is your skin in the game. It's what are you putting on the table? And that can actually run from a one-to-one -to, -one, um, to two to one to you know, 50 cents to one, and that what that means is is that for every dollar that they're going to invest in you, you have to come up with um, an equal share of that. And there are two kinds of cost shares. One is in kind, which could be your labor, could be you using your um, materials, could be uh, you know you're using your land, your buildings, your animals. The other cost share is actual cash, and most grants make it very clear which they're talking about and what the balance between the two is. But when they're asking you for a cash match, they're going to be wanting to see some proof that you actually have that cash there. Um, grants are also highly competitive, so you should know that going into it, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to actually get um, a grant your first time out. Uh, there's always, there's almost always way more applications than there is money to fund things, and um, quite, and quite frankly, a lot of people have applied two and three and four times before they, they're successful. So, you know, go into it thinking that, you know, it's going to be a learning experience, uh, that you're going to get better at it. But, you know, be realistic about your timeline. And if you absolutely positively need to see this money in the next eight months, a grant is probably not the best choice that you can make to get there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The other piece about grants that a lot of people don't um, understand or know intuitively is, is that most grants will not fund land or buildings or capital capital expenditures, so big equipment. Uh, there's certainly small amounts of equipment and supplies that can be covered under some grants. Uh, but again, they, they, it varies from grant to grant. But most will not pay for um, accessing land. So that's, that's pretty much the bad news there about grants. And you know, there's some hopeful news here. So we'll just spend a few minutes talking about a few of the more common grants um, and what they can and cannot do for you. And so the first one is, of course, SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. It's a national program. Uh, the country is divided into four regions, and each region does these things a little bit differently. In the Northeast, our farmer grants are due in December, so coming up very soon. You would have pretty much already had to have started. And you can see um, <coughs> that the, in the very first line of the description, and this comes directly from the SARE website, is that um, it is for commercial farmers who want to test a new idea using a field trial, on-farm demonstration, marketing initiative, or other technique. So if you unpack that sentence a little bit and read between the lines, commercial farmer means somebody who's got some experience doesn't have to be years and years of experience, but it's, it's not for somebody who has not had uh, ever sold anything to anybody. Um, it also is to test a new idea. So the idea of this grant is that you're going to be taking some risks. You're going to be trying something new, something that has not been proven, hopefully to improve your profitability, to improve your production, to improve your product quality for some particular reason. And so you're going to actually have to be taking kind of kind of um, you're going to have to be taking a bit of a, 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 of a of a risk, which is really why the federal government is willing to step in and say, we're going to give you a little bit of money to sort of um, balance out the risk that you're taking. So uh, they are capped at $15,000, which means that's the most that you can get. Um, the average is quite a bit lower, and, and folks rarely get the full $15,000. You'd have to have a very compelling case. Um, it's usually for one growing season, although you can extend it out in a research case uh, to a maximum of four years. Um, you've got to have a commercial product. Again, you've got to be a commercial farmer. Uh, and the funds, you know, as I said earlier, cannot be used for capital costs or to buy durable equipment. And um, let's see, Sean just got a question about first-time applicants don't succeed. Do you? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Sandra. First of all, the reason that most first-time applicants don't succeed is just because they're first-time applicants. It's because they're inexperienced. Um, they don't really know. There's, there's tricks to every grant proposal. There's just there's ways of saying things, there's language to use, and when you're just starting out, you don't necessarily know all that. And you're competing with people who may have been applying for 20 years. Um, who have just a lot more experience with figuring out that language. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. Everybody's got to have a first time. And sometimes the first timers get lucky and get funded. Um, it's just not the usual scenario. So I don't want to set anybody, else, anybody up with any false expectations. Um, and depending on the, um, and to answer the second part of your question, depending on the grant, you will usually get comments back from the reviewers. Most grants are reviewed by a team of individuals who make comments on, you know, what could have been better in the proposal, where it was weak, where it fell apart. And sometimes you will get those comments back, and that will be a good clue for you to um, learn how to do something better. Uh, in other cases, it's just, um, unfortunately, you'll get something back that says, it was a really good proposal, we really liked it, the committee really wanted to fund it, we just ran out of money, and it didn't score as high as the other proposals in the queue. So sometimes there isn't much that you could have done to improve it, it just was unlucky enough to be up against some other proposals that were even better. Um, the question about what is what's equipment versus what's durable. Um, it, durable equipment I th would be um, uh, like a tractor or a walk behind tr uh, tiller or um, a log splitter, and um, just regular equipment could be something as simple as you know hand tools. <coughs> All right, so that's the Sarah Farmer grant. So the next the one is also, again, another USDA grant. Uh, it's the Value Added Producer Grant. And this one, again, is national. It's a competitive program. And it's to help producers look into value added activities. So if you're thinking about something along the lines of cheese, or ice cream, or charcuterie, or uh, almost anything, um, I guess jams would qualify. Um, you know, this is for bio-based value-added products, you know, alternative energy products from something. Um, this is one that you might want to take a look at. <coughs> and again, this is a significantly bigger grant. The maximum grant you'll see is $100,000, and that's for a planning grant. So that's, that's a pretty sweet piece of pie. Um, and then if you succeed in getting a planning grant, and the planning grant is to, in fact, write a working capital grant. Then you can get up to $300,000 for that. Uh, there is a cost sharing requirement, and I encourage you to read the language very carefully because it does change from year to year a little bit. So you want to make sure that you're under you understand exactly what you'd be getting into. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see on the right hand side in the middle there's a list of uh, applicant types. So you can, you know, an independent producer can apply. And that's another thing you really want to look at is who can apply for this grant? Is it something that I can do? This is also something that a farmer cooperative or a producer group could in fact apply for. So a group could do this. Um, And again, at the last bullet, you'll see, once again, you cannot use the grant funds to purchase property or construct facilities. So um, that, and that's a fairly standard across the board criteria. So that was the value added producer grant. Again, um, you know, it's something to look into if you're, if you're ambitious and you've got a little bit of experience under your belt. Um, Uh, an example of working capital expense would be um, land lease, um, a mortgage payment. Um, trying to think, uh, anything that's really you know a loan for a, a equipment, a tractor or something, would would qualify as working capital expenses. <coughs> Those are things that you pay monthly that will um, that are helping to pay down a capital expense. So, all right, so the next one is uh, the SBIR, which is, um, I've completely blanked, it's a Small Business Innovation and Research, 
but it does have an agricultural component to it. And um, again, this is a highly competitive program, but and the idea is that you uh, are going to actually do some research and development uh, that has the potential for commercialization of some type of product. So if you're creative, if you're innovative, if you like to tinker with things, if you see a need for new equipment, uh, if you see a need for um, some new innovation on a farm, this is something that you might want to take a look at. And it comes in, well, it, it comes in three phases, but unfortunately the third phase is never funded. So. Uh, the first uh, phase is just a feasibility, and that's very like the planning grant that we talked about a few minutes ago. And it's $150,000, but it's for six months. So it's for you to do some intensive planning. It usually gets used hiring consultants to do a lot of marketing research, um, engineers maybe to do a little bit of, um, of their engineering magic to see if things can actually work. But then if you get successfully through that hoop and you actually create a good feasible plan, the next round is actually for a million dollars over two years. So it's not a small piece of change. Um, you know, again, those are the caps, but it doesn't, miss, and so you, know, you may not always get a million, but that's, you know, it's a pretty substantial grant over two years. Um, you'll see the, the logo there for Green Hair and Tools. Uh, these women were successful. They're in Pennsylvania. They're, uh, they got a phase one grant, I want to say about four years ago, maybe five now. Um, and they were successful in then getting a phase two grant. And they're, they create, they design products and engineer products for women farmers that are sized for women, that are built for women. Um, so. Uh, they were successful in their, their phase two project is about um, engineering um, a rototiller that actually will work better for women. So it's possible to get them. People in the Northeast have gotten them. Um, they would be the first to tell you, the Green Hair and Tools folks would be the first to tell you that it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of reporting. It's a lot of jumping through hoops. Um, it's a lot of filling out forms and paperwork and keeping the paper trail, but um, they were successful in doing it, and there's absolutely no reason why one of you couldn't be the next big one. And again, the phase three, again, is, is for implementation, but that's not funded, um, which you know, leads me to something about all of these grants that we've talked about so far, is, is that these all happen to be federal grants. They come out of the farm bill. And so they are subject to the political changes in the wind, um, as is just about everything else in our world these days. Um, so you just want to be mindful that because I'm saying these grants are here this year doesn't necessarily guarantee that they'll be there three years from now or even two years from now or maybe even next year when, when and if we actually have a farm bill. But for right now, they exist. Um, and if they go away, something will probably step in and take its place, but you'll have to do some research and, and start looking around for it. So there's a couple of um, local and state resources, and I, this is where um, it's going to get a little bit Vermont-centric. So those of you that aren't from Vermont, uh, bear with me, and I'll give you some ideas of where you might look for uh, equivalent types of, of programs. But, you know, there's the Vermont Community Foundation that occasionally does give out grants. Now, um, now to be honest, the, when they give out grants is usually uh, in the wake of a disaster. So, for example, last uh, year when Tropical Storm Irene came through and did so much damage, Vermont Community Foundation uh, was one of the leaders in actually uh, putting up grants for programs for farmers to help them uh, recover their fields, reclaim some of their land, mitigate some of the damage that was done to buildings, uh, and to cover some of the crop loss and feed loss. So, you know, they're certainly a partner in all of this. Um, a brand new one that's just emerging from some legislative work that came about last year in the state of Vermont is called the Vermont Working Landscape. That's actually going to hit uh, the RFP will be out at the end of this week, so literally in like two days' time. They wanted me to be absolutely sure I told you about this. You can find links to all of this on the Vermont New Farmer website. 
Um, and there is some money in there for farmers to apply. And you can't see because the type is so small, and I apologize for that. But um, it, there will be $3,000 to $15,000 grants. Um, it does require a 25% cash match. Uh, and you can go ahead and, and read about all of that. I'm sure that it will be widely publicized at the end of the week when the RFP goes public. Um, there's also a program in Vermont, and there is an equivalent program in some other states, although I can't list them for you. Uh, Vermont Farm Viability, where if you sign up for their business planning program and you go through the process of getting a, um, a business plan written, working with the consultants that they provide, taking advantage of the resources that they provide for you. At the end of the day, um, there are some grants that you can apply for that will help you with some of the infrastructure. So for example, if what you really wanted to do was to uh, build a cheese room, they might be able to help you out with it. Or if you needed to put in a cooler or buy a refrigerated truck, they, um, they have some resources that they can help give out. And again, the amounts on those grants vary from year to year, and it depends. Um, another sort of newcomer on the block, although they've been around probably for about three or four years now, is the Carrot Project. And I believe they only lend in the Northeast. Um, and that's, I think, New England plus uh, New York. But uh, again, you'd have to go to their website, and we can, we'll get you the link on that. And that's the Carrot Project. And again, they will do a little bit of technical assistance with you. Um, they will help support you and get your idea framed out a little bit. And then you can actually apply to them for some um, either grant money or low interest loans. So that's local state resources. So OK, so those were some examples. And there's more out there. Um, you know, um, I see that Jesse is helping me with my acronyms. RFP is a request for proposals. Um, that's generally how grants are announced. Um, federal grants have to go through the Federal Register. They have to be published. So uh, you know, that's, that's usually the first stop for you, is when you get a notice that there's a grant out, that's what you want to do, is, is find the RFP and read it. It's deadly. I'm not, I won't apologize for it, but it's just it's awful. It's legalese. It's full of governmentese, acronyms, um, tiny type. And, but it is your map to everything you need to know. So first of all, do your research. Figure out what you're going to need the money for. And then select the sources that you're going to go after very carefully. Because you want it to be a good match. Um, there's no point. It takes a ton of time and effort to write a good grant application. There's no point in going through all that time if the people are going to look at it and say, this doesn't even qualify for our project, and, and throw it in the shredder. Um, so, so be be very clear about uh, what you're gonna uh, what you're gonna ask for the money for, and then go out and find the sources that will give you what you want and what you need, and that will work with you. Uh, understand the timeline. The thing about grants that that frustrates a lot of people, a lot of farmers that I've worked with over the years, is that they're they're run by the timeline. So if they tell you that it's due on uh, December 3rd, uh, then you better figure out whether they mean December 3rd at midnight, or do they need December 3rd at the close of business? And if they mean at the close of business, which time zone do they mean? Do they mean Eastern Standard, Central? And it will depend on where they're located. And they are uh, fanatics about this. They use this as a weeding technique. So if it arrives two hours late, they will throw it away. They will not take the time. Now again, there are probably small foundations that would be an exception to this rule. But I want, I want to get you thinking about how to be um, successful. And the, the very first rule is to figure out the timeline, figure out when is it going to be due, and what do I have to submit. I'll be honest with you, you almost always get about six weeks notice for these things, which is not a lot of time. So, And for farmers, it can be a horrific time. SARE tries to be pretty, um, you know, pretty respectful of farmers' times because they've worked with farmers for many years. So as the regions change, um, you know, the, their farmer grants timeline is a little bit different. And it tries to respect sort of a, a, a workable time frame for farmers. 
so you want to read the, the RFP carefully. Uh, the RFP will describe exactly what's going to be expected in the grant. Uh, you want to follow the instructions, and the instructions will get to the point of um, ludicrous at some level. Some of them will tell you what the margins on the paper can be. Some of them will tell you that they want it double spaced. Some of them will tell you that they need the pages numbered and that they need a header and a footer to say exactly this or exactly that. Um, and they're not kidding. These are, again, these are weeding strategies. So if they get 500 grant applications and they know they can only fund 10, uh, the first cut is the people who used the wrong size font, the people who added an extra page. They said it was a 12 page limit and you thought 13 pages would be okay because you were in the middle of a really good paragraph. Um, so not so much with grants. This, they're, they're pretty ruthless about this piece of it. Um, <coughs> you know, if you're not, if you're new to grants or even if you're not new to grants, um, Find a network of people to consult with. Make sure somebody's going to proofread your, your grant uh, before you submit it. But just it's nice to work with a team to kick ideas around because the questions that other people will ask you will help clarify in your own head uh, where you need to be more clear about something. Because the problem with grants is that you don't have a lot of space. I mean, most grants have a pretty short number of pages, you know, five to 12 maybe or so. And so you're trying to explain this really complicated idea, but it's crystal clear in your head. Unfortunately, it might not be crystal clear in the heads of the people who are reviewing it and trying to make a thumbs up or thumbs down decision. So that's one of the things that you're going to want to, um, to use your, your, your consultant with your informal brain trust here. And you know, and obviously to get them to proofread it because you don't want to send something in that has a lot of typos, a lot of formatting errors. Uh, and again, be crystal clear before you accept a grant about what the matching requirements are. What are you going to be providing and how much are you going to be providing? Because, you know, if, a, if, you, if you're applying for a half a million dollar grant but it comes with a 25% cash match, that's a pretty significant chunk of change you're going to have to uh, pony up. And again, they're going to be asking for proof that you actually have that before they release the funds. Um, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about the next leg of the stool, which um, is usually a lot less popular, but um, is, is really important and, and I'm, I'm going to try to make a case for why you should not be gun shy about loans. Um, they come in a, in a bunch of different varieties and from a bunch of different places. Certainly one of the biggest agricultural lenders is uh, the USDA through Farm Service Agency. And some of you may have heard of uh, SBA, the Small Business Administration. That's the, the sister partner to Farm Service Agency. And the reason that I'm mentioning both is because we interpret um, the word agriculture very broadly here. And there are some times where a business um, that that some of us might think is agricultural might actually fit under SBA um, as well. So there's a little bit of a you know gray area in between where there's some overlap. But Farm Service Agency primarily lends for food and fiber businesses. So if you're not producing food or fiber, um, if, and, and FSA says no, sorry, that doesn't qualify. Then ask them if F SBA might be an option. And they have very similar programs. They have very similar set of sides. So they have new farmer, uh, new farmer and or new business owner money. They have pots that are dedicated for women. They have pots that are dedicated for underserved audiences. So they're they're very similar in terms of how they operate. Um, there are two ways that USDA gives money to farmers, and the one is a direct loan and one is a guaranteed loan. A direct loan is where they actually write you the check, so they are the banker. They give you um, the loan that you've requested, and it's usually fairly low interest. It's very competitive. Um, it has very favorable terms. Uh, and it's a good deal. The problem is is that over time that budget has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and there just is not a lot of direct loan money out there. 
Um, at the same time, of course, land prices and farm prices have gone up and up and up. So um, as you can imagine, there's not as much direct loan money out there as, as there is need for it in any year. Um, the guaranteed portion is um, a little bit uh, better situation because that, that goes out to banks and other lenders that are certified by USDA to be partners and what a uh, farm service agency will do is guarantee the loan. So it might be, um, you know, your local bank uh, would actually make the loan but USDA is sweetening the pot a little by guaranteeing, saying if for some reason Farmer John or Farmer Sue defaults on this loan, we guarantee that you won't lose any money on this. We will cover the loss. So that's, that's the difference between direct and guaranteed loans. Again, they both usually USDA will have the most favorable interest rates um, and terms. In Vermont, there is an economic development authority which has an agricultural uh, arm which is called VAC here. It's the Vermont Ag Credit Corporation. Um, they're a very well known and trusted partner in financing agriculture. Uh, other states have economic development organizations and some of them do have agricultural arms so I would encourage you to get in touch with them. Uh, and then, of course, there's commercial banks and credit unions. Not as as common in agricultural lending as they used to be, but still, you know, if you have a good relationship with a local bank or a local credit union, um, I would certainly stop in and, and find out what kinds of loans they were prepared to make and what kind of terms you could get with them. Uh, and again, a lot of it depends on what you're doing. You know, a bank, you'd be looking for a different kind of bank to fund, um, you know, a million dollar purchase versus, you know, a $30,000 operating loan. Uh, if, again, another thing for you to look for is revolving loan funds. They're out there. Uh, Vermont has a number of them. You can, and there, there's all, I mean, there's something for everybody. There's revolving loan funds for just about every uh, group that you can imagine. Um, NOFA, which is Vermont, uh, NOFA Vermont, which is Vermont's um, organic farmer certifier, has a revolving loan fund that they administer. Um, there's a bunch of others that are around. Some of them uh, specialize in lending to people who don't have great credit, so if you're in a position where your credit has been compromised at some point in time, um, you know, finding a revolving loan fund might be a good opportunity for you to sort of get back in the game, rebuild that credit score and that credit history. Um, revolving loan funds, I'll just say this now while I'm thinking about it so I don't forget, tend to charge, and again, this is, this is a gross um, overgeneralization because this isn't true across the board, but very often for small amounts of money, the interest rate looks pretty high on paper. But I tell the farmers that when I'm, that I'm working with is that, you know, the interest rate isn't the thing that you need to be the most concerned about because if you've got a good business and your business is sustainable, your customers are going to pay the interest rate. You're not going to pay it. Um, it just has to be a factor in how you set your prices and how you do your work and how you construct your business. So don't let an interest rate be the only deciding factor. Um, what you really want to look for in a lender is somebody that you can have a relationship with, somebody that is going to take the time to understand your business, um, somebody that's going to take the time to respond to your questions and be a partner with you. Um, so the last thing you want is somebody who is going to, um, you know, sort of uh, call in the loan at the first sign of trouble. So I, I would pay a couple of extra interest percentage points uh, for a good relationship any day of the week and would encourage you to certainly look into that. Um, So, all right, so you have great credit, but little capital asset in another which, um, yeah, well, it, it again, it depends. Um, Dan, it depends on how much money you're looking for. So uh, let me continue through, and if I don't get that question answered in, in, as we go along, then uh, poke me again, so because I it's, a, it's an important question, and I want to um, give it its due time. 
All right. So, uh, success with loans. How you how you uh, close the deal on these loans? First of all, is there should be no surprises. You need to be absolutely clear with your lender and on the paper what's going on. So, if um, if you don't have a lot of equity. If you don't have a lot to contribute, you need to be clear about that. If there was a bankruptcy or some bad news in your past, you need to be clear about that. Um, you know, do the homework. Find out what kind of terms are available. Find out what kind of uh, interest rates you're looking at. Find out whether you're looking at fixed or variable interest rates. Uh, you're going to have to have a plan of some type. It's an almost certainty that, particularly if you're looking to buy a farm, buy land, uh, you're going to need to start the process early because it will take some time. And again, the downside of working with USDA is that it can take a lot of time. And their money, again, is determined by federal appropriations. So um, you know, at the beginning of the federal fiscal year, when everything is working properly, which hasn't been the case for the last few years, but when everything's working properly, the the new fiscal federal fiscal year starts on October one, and they're usually flush with money. Um, then they spend down their money. Then all the states put everything they have back in surplus back into a pool and redistribute it again. So there's these peaks and valleys. And if you are looking to buy a farm and how you happen to hit it in one of those valleys, it could take you a little bit of time. So you want to start those relationships early so that people know you're looking, so that you have something on file, so that people are prepared to help you. Um, build relationships is really important. Um, you know, again, it doesn't. It seems weird that we're talking about financing a farm, and I'm talking about relationships. But that's where that's where the money is. It's. I mean, people like to do business with people that they know or people that they trust. So create your networks. A lot of times, too, especially with grants, you don't necessarily know all the RFPs that are coming out that are going. So if you have a wide enough network, uh, you know people will help you. I mean, that's sort of what the Vermont New Farmer Network is about, is you know, we're, we're trying to create those relationships. We try to push out RFPs, and we try to keep our website current. So if something's coming up, we want to be able to tell you about it. But we can't if we don't know that you're out there. <coughs> um, you know, communicate. If you, if you submit a loan application and you don't hear, ask. Um, Ask about like when will I when will I get a notice when how will I be informed and very much like um, somebody asked a question earlier of like how would I know if my if my grant gets turned down how will I know what to improve and I'll, I said well you're um, you know a lot of sometimes grants reviewers will release comments and give you some suggestions and hints and. Uh, program officers at foundations are usually quite good at that as well. Well, in a loan, if you're turned down for a loan, they are legally required to tell you why, what happened. So you'll know before you apply for another no loan what happened. So it's important to keep those lines of communications um, open um, and not let your anger and your disappointment um, burn bridges that you're going to need later down the road. And the last piece is negotiate. And that's, you know, just a lot of things in a bank are negotiable. So don't be afraid to ask your lender, you know, is this, can we extend this time frame another five years? Can we extend this, you know, what, you know, if I pay points up front, can I reduce this interest rate by two percentage points or something? You know, ask what's negotiable, because you won't know unless you ask. I mean, they don't advertise everything for good reason. All right, let's move on to government programs, and then we can um, all get back to questions. So government programs are, you know, again, it's not for people who are or haven't quite started their business yet. It's not going to get you onto the land. It's going to help make life easier for you once you are on the land. Um, and these usually fall into conservation programs, so energy programs, and crop insurance. Those are sort of the big ones that USDA Farm Service Agency and NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. 
um, those are two sister programs, sister arms of USDA, and these are the big program areas that they operate. Now there can also be state programs, um, sometimes there are water quality programs, sometimes there are um, wildlife protection programs, so again, you want to get onto as many mailing lists as you can so that you're aware of where these programs are, what's the cycle that they follow, and how do you apply. <clears throat> so again, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but you've got to start early. These programs, um, you know, come with an application period. Uh, they usually will announce the timeline. They'll say when the application period is um, open and you need to get your stuff in there. You need to have good records. This is particularly true for anything that's a federal program. Um, you're going to have to have production records. And um, I'll just say quickly, one of the, you know, if there is a disaster, you can't predict ahead of time where an emergency program is going to pop up. But you can predict that if you don't have records, you're not going to qualify. So for example, um, quite a few years ago now, we had a pretty huge ice storm in the northeast, took out an awful lot of maple trees and did a lot of damage. There was an emergency program that was turned around within two or three months, but the catch was that you had to have production records to be able to prove how your um, how the, your, your syrup production was going to be impacted as a result of the loss of these trees. If you couldn't prove it, you couldn't get the money. So we sent an awful lot of money back to the federal government because we nobody had good records then. Uh, <coughs> in most of these programs, and this is true with loans, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's as true with grants, but it's certainly true with loans and it's certainly true with programs, is you want to identify as a beginning farmer if you qualify. And a beginning farmer, it might surprise you to learn, is actually 10 years, up to 10 years in production. Um, and maybe even a little longer if you spend a few years as an apprentice or an intern because they won't count those years against you. So um, actually up to 10 years you can be a, a beginning farmer. And there are set aside monies in most of the things I've talked about tonight for beginning farmers specifically. So um, don't feel at all shy about asking for that money. Uh, you need to be an advocate for yourself, which means that you know there's a lot of applications going in there. Um, you need to email, pick up the phone call, ask if your application was received, ask if it's being forwarded, ask if there's anything else you can do. Um, just double check. These are really busy offices with a lot of stuff and it's easy for a piece of paper to slip through the cracks and it's not necessarily that anybody is trying to undercut you. It's just that you need to be your own advocate. Um, again, with programs, as with uh, grants, there's very often cost share requirements, so you need to understand, if I take this money, what am I going to be doing? You know, if this money is going to pay for fencing, what do I have to bring to the table? Um, and understand how and when payments get made, because one of the big disappointments for many farmers is, is that most of these programs will only give you the money after the fact work is done. So it might be that they're going to create a watering system and some pastures for you. Well, the expectation is, is that you have to pay to have the work done and then send them the invoice and they'll pay. Um, a lot of farmers don't have that cash, so sometimes they have to work with a bank to get a short-term line of credit opened so that they have the money to pay the workers who are actually doing those, that work. Um, but those are things you just want to know before you get in too deep because you don't want to be disappointed at the 11th hour. Okay, now we'll move into something else, which is sort of like all these uh, traditional and non-traditional financing, and there's a bunch of different places to go for information, and there's so much um, information out there. There's this sort of new and emerging thing called crowdfunding, which some of you, I'm sure you might have heard of Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which is basically um, asking the general public to contribute to, you know, to help you raise money. So, and in return, you might give them something. So there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to go about this, and it could be a webinar all by itself. So I'm, I'm just going to scratch the surface, but if you're interested, um, I would certainly just Google crowdfunding, and you'll probably get more information than you know what to do with. Uh, but it can be kind of an interesting way to do things, and it, 
it's modeled a little bit after the CSA model where, you know, your customers or your, your members are paying up front so that you have cash to do the things you need to do. And then over the season, you to pay them back, quote unquote, with um, whatever they contracted for, whether that be um, a bag of vegetables every week or um, a meat share every month or eggs or whatever happens to be in your particular CSA. Uh, and so crowdfunding works very, very much similar to that, only most of it is online. You set up a site, you go to these places and you, you, you establish a threshold. And the way that most of them work is, is that it's an all or nothing thing. So if I say I want to raise $50,000, if I raise $47,000, I don't get anything. If I raise the, the 50000 then I actually, then, then people are on the hook. So, you know, people will, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting new concept. The legislation just got changed last year, so it's very new. There's not a lot of people who know a lot about it. Um, and your attorneys and your um, accountants may get really nervous if you start talking about it. So I would encourage you to uh, do some research first and go in prepared, because a lot of them just haven't had time to get up to speed on um, how it works. Uh, FAF financing is one of the oldest uh, financing strategies in the world. It's friends and family. Um, I encourage, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong if friends and family are in a position to be able to help you out um, to let them do that. <coughs> um, the one thing I will say is make absolutely sure that you have a contract um, and that you, you know that you're both signing and you're both clear on the terms because when families fall apart, um, these things get really ugly really fast, and I would hate to have that happen to any of you. Um, but, you know, in many cases, it's your, your family and friends or friends of friends that are in a position to be able to help, and so there's, there's nothing wrong with asking. We talked about the CSA model a little bit. That's a nice way to get operating money. It doesn't very often pay for the startup capital. Uh, there's um, in Vermont, there's a local war today site which it operates a little bit like crowdfunding, but a little, you know, but but different. So um, and it primarily seems to be restaurants and value-added producers. But you know, I would check it out if you're interested. Basically, uh, again, you pick an amount that you want to go for, be ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars or or. $5,000 um, and you create a sort of gift level so it's kind of like a you know a public radio pledge drive kind of thing where if I give a certain amount I get this so if I give $500 I get um, I don't know maybe a wheel of your cheese or um, if I give $1,000 maybe I get a wheel of cheese and invited to a dinner at the farm or something so uh, you know, check it out. It's it's going to continue to grow. I think. I think it's it's a good partner with the local food systems and the the um, emphasis that we're putting on local foods and community sustainability and community partnering. So, um, you know, be sure to check those out. Um, another thing you can do is, and this is, you know, particularly if you don't have access to land, if land is the big barrier for you, is try partnering with a landowner or, or an, an NGO, a non-government um, organization. Uh, land trusts frequently have uh, farms available that they will try to get farmers on. There are places like the Intervale Foundation incubator sites where, you know, you can get onto some land and at least, you know, get those first few production years and seasons under your belt and get started. Um, and then, of course, the dream of everybody is an angel investor. They're really uncommon, but they exist. They're out there. Um, these are people who are philanthropists in the community and want to invest in farms and, um, you know, but they're shrewd business uh, people generally speaking and they don't suffer fools lightly. So have your plan ready, have it, um, you know, know it cold before you, and see if you can get a ch an, an audience with them and just pitch them on an idea. It's um, scary as heck, but, you know, they're out there and sometimes it works. So um, if that's an avenue that you want to go down, I would, I would encourage you to do some research. Find out who the angel investors are in your area. 
Um, there are venture capital groups um, in most states. Um, and some of them even have um, socially responsible angel investors. So um, do a little bit of research and uh, use your search engines and, and you'll be able to turn off a few. And just find out how often do they entertain proposals, what does it take. You know, some of them have regular meetings every quarterly and people come in, literally. They invite business owners to come in and pitch them. So the motivation piece is, um, this is sort of the guiding question. I mean, remember, for all of these things, whether it's somebody giving you a grant, somebody loaning you money, um, somebody offering you program dollars, um, it's never about you. It's always about them. And this is the guiding question that they're always going to be thinking. Um, grant agencies are always going to be thinking, how does this fulfill my organizational mission? It's the only thing. It's what they live and die for. Is giving you the money going to forward my mission or not? Uh, and if it's not, then I can't take a chance on it. For lenders, it depends a little bit on whether they're public or private. Um, a private banker is going to be very clear. It's all about the bottom line. It's like, what's the likelihood you're going to repay this loan? Um, you wish that they would love your business as much as you do, but the truth is, is they're really worried. They've got investors of their own. They've got a board to respond to. Um, so they just want to know, can you make the payments, and are you a good bankable risk? Um, a public lender is going to ask the same question, but they're also going to have to put it through that filter of, does this fit with my mission? So USDA Farm Service Agency, for example, has a very different mission than your local downtown privately owned bank. Uh, <coughs> programs are going to say, does the application fit our profile? You know, what are we trying to do? Is this really going to improve water quality? Is this in a very important watershed? Um, is this a very vulnerable piece of land? And the other thing they're going to ask is, is this, is this an application? applicant that we trust to follow through? Are they going to do it? If we give them or promise them, you know, $20,000 for, uh, for hoop houses or for a new water system or for new fencing, um, what's the likelihood that they're actually going to follow through? Because once we've committed the money, even though we don't actually ever spend it, it holds us up for a whole season and being able to commit to somebody else. So they're going to be really thinking about, you know, sort of what's your credibility like? Um, and all those non-traditional sources, the angel investors, the Kickstarters, all that, it's all going to be about what's in it for me. Um, you know, if I'm looking for a place to invest a few money, a few dollars, um, what do I get out of it? You know, I mean, feeling good is nice, but I, you know, most investors want a little bit more, so they're going to be looking for something else. So tips for success. This is this is it, and then um, I'll entertain any questions, and I can stay on a little bit late if we need to, but, you know, really, is it feasible? Get that business plan done. Um, know the numbers and the trends. Um, don't be afraid to use professionals. You don't need to be a, uh, an accountant or a bookkeeper. Um, you can buy a couple hours of an accountant or bookkeeper's time. You don't need to be a lawyer. You can buy a little bit of legal time to help you answer those trickier questions. Um, some steps that all of you can take right off tonight, tomorrow, as soon as possible. Check your credit report. Everybody is entitled to a free credit report once a year. Uh, you can apply for it online. Um, it is not the same thing as a credit score, but they are very much related. Uh, you can update your resume and keep it updated because you're always going to have to attach a resume if you're looking for, um, even for grants now, they're going to want to hear something about you. They're going to want to know what's your experience, what's your background, so get your resume updated. Uh, we talked about networks. Um, you know, develop a professional network. Um, it's, it's really useful. Grants in particular are almost always going to be looking for letters of reference um, or letters of support. So that professional network comes in really handy when you don't have to think about, well, who are three people I can quickly ask to turn around a letter <coughs> for me. Um, make sure you ask questions. Make sure you understand. Um, this stuff is complicated and 
Um, and, and, and it's not intuitive in many cases, so ask questions. Um, most grants have program officers that you can call or email and ask questions. Um, most lenders have, uh, are happy to take questions. They would much rather um, provide some advice up front and save both of you um, the agony of having to go through it again. Uh, you know, be aware of those opportunities and take advantage. A lot of these opportunities are out there to help you. Um, don't be afraid to package things, but package them based on a comprehensive plan, as I said at the beginning. The thing that you do not want to do is apply for a grant to say, um, uh, study the effects of, I don't know, some, some type of, of grain and, or feeding structure on a, on a milking herd, so you've got milking goats or something. Um, the last thing you want to do is have a grant, uh, pay for part of that, and then have a loan to buy, uh, you know, animals or something, because the two can get muddy really quickly. So you want to be crystal clear in your paper trail what belongs to what. Um, make sure that you under identify your contribution. What are you going to be providing? What are you bringing to the table? Lenders are going to ask for a little bit of a down payment, um, more or less, depending on who you, who's doing the lending for you. Um, and, and loans and programs will, will often have this cost share criteria. And understand the terms. Be crystal clear about like how long do I have to use this money? What happens if I don't use all of it? Um, what kind of reporting do I have to do? What happens if I'm late with my reporting? What happens if the whole grant turns upside down and I realize that the thing that I thought I was going to study is, is tanking? It's not going to happen. What happens to that? Um, so, I'm ready to take some questions, and it looks like there's a few there, and we don't have much time left, and I apologize for that, but um, I will put my email in the box, and we'll be happy to have you correspond. Um, okay, so if you don't have a lot of collateral um, or capital, uh, and it depends... Um, you know, uh, some of the land, some of the lending programs, if you're talking about like buying land, will actually finance 100% for beginning farmers. So uh, sometimes it's not a, a, a barrier, sometimes it is. Um, it just depends on the programs and quite frankly, the more help you need, uh, the longer it probably takes, so the longer, the, the more careful you want to work on your business plan, have an absolutely uh, crystal clear, positive business plan in place, and then start shopping. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Farming is not cheap, and buying land is, is a big step, but it doesn't have to be the first step. There are a lot of people running very profitable farms on land that they don't own. So I, I always encourage people, check out the other options, too. Don't feel like buying land is the, the first hurdle you have to get over, because very often um, it's not. Uh, is someone... Um, yes, I think uh, I think you said you were from Vermont, so you should definitely check out our website. We have uh, classes on helping with all those things, and we've got um, an ag finance uh, session coming up this winter, and um, there's there's always scholarships available. So I encourage folks to get into those classes. Uh, a because you'll learn a lot, and B because uh, you get to network with the other people in the class, and you get to set yourself up um, <coughs> with um, sort of a network of people that will help you. And I'm apologizing if I'm not if I've missed your question. We think you're awesome too, Shonda. Uh, let's see. All right, Jesse, is there um, anything by way of wrap up? So, Mary, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot. Um, I always do in these webinars, and it's uh, been great to 
to get your perspective on this. Um, please do take a moment to fill out, give us your feedback. Um, we really do look at every survey that gets uh, filled out and use that to shape um, future programming for our webinars. So uh, click that live link before you take off and uh, open that up in your browser. Um, also, we do have a wealth of resources about land access, business planning, and everything like that on our website. Um, so uh, another uh, reason to uh, go over there and, and check that out. If you want uh, to send uh, to have follow-up information, uh, go ahead and put your email in the chat box. I'll capture that, send you some information about our program and the services that we can provide. Um, and if you are out of state, uh, a lot, um, in fact, almost most of our uh, information on our website is relevant um, regardless of where you live. So uh, check that out. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. And I would just say also, um, if you are out of state, don't be afraid to shoot us an email because we've got networks all over the country and we might be able to hook you up with somebody in your backyard that can help you out too. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Have a good evening. Great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>